Madam President. Dr. Francis Wood, who retired in 2013 after many years as head of the Chinese section at the British Library, has made an outstanding contribution not only to scholarship but also to public life and public understanding in the field of the arts, material culture and history of China. As an art historian, historian, sinologist, curator, teacher, broadcaster, and a prolific and imaginative author. She is a scholar who has modestly but brilliantly made extraordinary contributions to knowledge and been able to communicate them to diverse audiences. Born in London in 1948, Wood went to art school in 1967 in Liverpool before going up to Cambridge to read Chinese. She joined the British Library in 1977. In the course of her long career at the library, which included her completing a PhD under William Watson at the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art in 1984, Wood curated or co-curated numerous exhibitions, such as a major one called Chinese Printmaking Today, which traveled widely across the British Isles. She also produced many important publications some of these books have achieved attention far beyond the field of Chinese art and culture, and not just because she has that knack, which is the envy of other scholars, namely coming up with a seriously catchy title. Take Did Marco Polo Go to China? of 1995, a highly provocative book written 700 years after the event, which probed the veracity of the Polo's travels to China and their service under Kublai Khan, highlighting Marco's failing to mention the drinking of tea, the foot binding of Chinese women, and the Great Wall. In the view of the Times, Wood's book was, quote, likely to rock the foundations of a basic tenet of European civilization, unquote. And what about the highly entertaining and very funny Hand Grenade Practice in Peking, My Part in the Cultural Revolution, published in 2000, which reflected on her experiences as one of the first foreign students to travel to communist China to learn Chinese as an undergraduate at Peking University at the tail end of the Cultural Revolution in 1975-76. Wood's publications can be seen as colorful, serious, and useful but they also demonstrate her range of interests and the depth of her expertise, her intellectual independence, her passion for China, and her resilience. If her The Lure of China is evocative, her guidebooks, including The Blue Guide to China, for which she tape recorded her way around the country, and Companion to China, illustrate her judgment, good sense, and sheer commitment. Francis Wood was an advocate for China long before this came into vogue in the West since the turn of the century. She has been at the heart of the UK's historically tight-knit group of Sinologists as an early member of the Society for Anglo-Chinese Understanding, a fellow of the 48 Group Club, and a member of the Steering Committee of the International Dunhuang Project. She has long been a reliable British authority on China, whether for lunches at Downing Street or evenings at the embassy. She would balk, however, at being seen as an insider. Rather, she is, in the best sense of the term, a public intellectual. She's been a frequent contributor to BBC Radio 4 programs like In Our Time and on topics far beyond Marco Polo. She even represented her alma mater, Newnham College, Cambridge, on a Christmas special of University Challenge in 2012. Her scholarly output, her career, and indeed her status as a living national treasure were celebrated when she was invited to be a castaway on Desert Island Discs in 2010. She spoke passionately about the Diamond Sutra, the exemplar of the earliest printing in China in the collection of the British Library. She has since not shied away from reminding our research institutions that research should be at the heart of what they do. Wood has been and continues to be an experienced and always engaging interpreter of China to diverse audiences, both in the UK and in China. She is as comfortable drawing on her research on the historical Silk Road 
to address a conference of business and planning leaders in China today as she is engaging with school teachers and school children visiting the Chinese collections in the British Library, launching a volume of scholarly research, or teaching on the SOAS postgraduate diploma course in Chinese art. Simply put, Francis Wood is much cherished by so many people from all over the world. The respect and admiration of those individuals, including many of those she has taught, underpinned the founding of the Francis Wood Appreciation Society, which continues to meet regularly in London to celebrate her and what she has done, not just her scholarship, but also her passion, her wit, and her mature attitude to China and Chinese culture. Having nominated Francis for this honorary doctorate from SOAS on the occasion of her retirement, I was honored to be invited to deliver this citation. It gives me the greatest pleasure to see Francis receive this award today, despite her modesty, in recognition of her many outstanding achievements and her distinguished contribution to public life in the field of Chinese art and culture. Thank you so very much. I feel very overwhelmed. Um, and I think it's quite important, perhaps, to point out that one of the things that Shane missed out of my curriculum vitae was my rather unsuccessful period as a very junior librarian in SOAS. Um, <laughs> almost whenever I come into SOAS, I still have that sense of being a very junior member of staff. I joined the library more than 30 years ago as, as I say, a very junior member of staff and failed miserably to um, ascend the great ladder of promotion. I remember the, there were various carrots offered by the librarian. He would say, do a PhD and we'll see. So I did a PhD and saw nothing. <laughs> his, his next offer was that I should obtain a library qualification and we would see about promotion. But that was a step too far for me. My father, who ended his career as principal keeper of the Department of Printed Books in the British Museum, had attempted to gain library qualifications before the Second World War. He found the course unutterably boring, failed the exams, and retained a lifelong prejudice against people with library qualifications. <laughs> so I obtained no library qualifications during my time at SOAS. But I am eternally grateful to SOAS for various aspects of its support for me in, in, in my work and, and life. It, um, it gave me the support to struggle through the PhD with Professor Watson. And I must also thank SOAS for allowing me to take a year's leave off to go to China, as Shane mentioned, on a British Council scholarship in 1975. Though 1975 was a, to 1976 was a very peculiar year in China, it was the last year of the Cultural Revolution, although we did not know it at the time, but it had a very profound effect on me. My language improved immeasurably, and I had a wonderful time taking photographs of old buildings and measuring houses for my PhD. And ever since then, I have greatly enjoyed writing about China and Chinese history. My aim has simply always been just to pass on my fascination with this very different culture. In recent years, I've also been lucky enough, I think, to lecture on the, the um, Diploma in Asian Arts, which is held at, at SOAS, run by Hattie. These diploma courses attract the most interesting students, just like all of the rest of you here, interesting students who make teaching so amazingly pleasurable. And I also think sometimes when I spend a weekend in the countryside and fantasize about living in rural isolation, how lucky I am to live in London with access to SOAS. There are fascinating lectures of all sorts that semi-outsiders like myself can attend, um, attending seminars um, run by people like Professor Hox or, or Shane. They expand our knowledge and refresh our interest, and I'm terribly honored to feel that I've got a very small part in this great institution. 
I'd finally like to say, too, that I recommend to all of you the library at SOAS. Um, <laughs> When I was there, even though I was very junior, it was, I think, the most important, in the 1970s, certainly, it was the most important research library for Chinese, certainly in Europe and possibly further. As I remember, librarians from Leiden coming and spending months photocropying so much material in SOAS, which was um, unique to Europe. And SOAS Library has more recently helped me greatly. I was invited to give a lecture um, at the Globe Theatre in London when they were, they were putting on a production of Richard III in Chinese. So giving a lecture there seemed to me to be a very important thing, but I was horrified to discover that the British Library, in its wisdom, had sent its two copies of Richard III in Chinese up to the north of England and lost them. However, as I panicked, I found a copy in SOAS. So in small ways and in large ways, SOAS has done a great deal for me, and I'm deeply honoured by um, this event today. Thank you very much.